Hi, thanks for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu City, Arizona. We are on week three of the Ripple Effect series, and today's message is on generous results. The scripture we'll be studying is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 8 through 15. If you enjoy following along with the Life Notes, you can download them now from calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, here's Pastor Robert Smith. You can be seated, and I want to welcome you today. My name is Robert. I'm one of the pastors here. And if you've got a Bible or Bible app on your device, you can open that up to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It's where we're going to be at today. And uh, as always, if you don't have a Bible with you or Bible app on your device, you can use one of the Bibles in the seats in front of you. And if you use one of those and would like to take it home, you are more than welcome to do that. In fact, we'd love to give you that as our gift today so that you can read and apply God's Word, because we know that if you do that, it will change your life. And if you're using one of those Bibles, you'll find 2 Corinthians 9 on page 100, 100, or sorry, 1150. Page 1150 is where you'll find uh, 2 Corinthians 9. Now, a few weeks ago, we started this this series called Ripple Effect with a question Pastor Chad did, and and that is, who's risk takers and who's risk averse? Uh, Now, uh, as a little refresher, who in here would call themselves a risk taker? Okay, and who of you would like to be uh, risk avoiders? Uh, we'll call it that. Uh, and, and it's pretty split, and it's been interesting to kind of dive in to why that is. And I think a lot of that is how we interpret the data of the risk. Now, I think that those who are risk takers only look at the positives. We look at, hey, what is the, the advantage to the situation? What positive is going to come? What happens if everything goes right? And those that are risk averse just look at the negatives. Um, but We'll get to that in a second, but there's, there's so much that plays into how we evaluate those risks, and sometimes it's even what's the situation, what's your age or stage of life. I've noticed that, uh, that as I've become a husband and a father, I am less likely to take risks because there's people counting on me and depending on me. Maybe some of you resonate, although apparently if you put me on a dirt bike in Mexico, I have a different uh, paradigm for risk-taking, hence my souvenir from my riding trip last week, but uh, we interpret those inputs differently and it determines whether we're risk takers or risk avoiders. And and I think that as you dive into why do people want to avoid risk, you look, you see that that they often look at the negatives. They look at what's going to, what bad's going to happen if this doesn't go well. How is this going to affect me? If things fall apart, what's the consequences going to be? Maybe predominantly over the advantages. Maybe even they look at the risk so much they avoid the positives. What benefits will come from this risk? What are the potential upsides? How will this work out well if everything goes according to plan? And I say all this because I think that if we look at our life as Christ followers, it is very easy for us to predominantly become spiritual risk avoiders. We can look at the life that God has for us and we can see all of the downsides first. We can see all the sacrifice that following and obeying him will take. We can look at all that we might have to give up or sacrifice. Maybe we look at what God is calling us to and we just think about what are people gonna think? What are they gonna say? How how is my life going to look different because of me following God and his plan? And we get so focused on that, maybe we miss the upsides. We miss how God will change our life if we obey. We miss the the blessings that will come, the joy that will permeate our life, the the purpose that we will feel walking with him. And for the last few weeks, we've been challenging you guys as a community to grow in your willingness to take that next step of obedience to Jesus. For some, that is just calling Jesus your savior and entering a life-changing relationship with him. For some of you, that's going public with baptism and saying, okay, I'm willing to to confess to the world that I'm a follower of Christ. For some, it's making God a priority in your life and serving and making a commitment in that way. But specifically, for the last few weeks, we've been talking about what would it look like if we followed God's plan with our finances? What if we actually took God's word seriously and tithed off of our income? And a tithe is something that's established in the Old Testament as part of God's covenant and instructions to us. And it's something that Jesus affirms and continues in the New Testament. And it's literally us saying, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to give you back 10% of my income. Now, I want to pause just on the front end of this and say, if you're not at a place that you call Jesus your Lord and Savior, then, then 
by all means, listen in. But this is not an expectation for you. This is not something that is placed on you. This is something that's part of followers of Jesus, our desire to continue growing in obedience to God's plan for our life. But similar to that idea of spiritual risk-taking, we may look at this idea of giving and tithing and going, man, I just see all the downsides. I do the math and I think about how much it's gonna cost me and all the things I won't be able to pay and what if I don't have enough money to pay my bills and what if I regret it and I won't be able to do anything about it. We think about all the negatives. And see, here in 2 Corinthians 9, Paul is, is kind of leading this church in Corinth to to understand the importance of financial generosity. And he speaks to maybe the same tension they were feeling of, oh, I don't know about this, I see all these risks. And he wants them and I think us today to see the positives that are possible, to see the advantages that are present for us if we're willing to step in faith to God's plan for our life in this area. And so I want us to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 8 through 14, and take a look at what that has for us today. So 2 Corinthians 9, starting verse 8, it says this, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he is distributed freely. He is given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplied seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from the confession of the gospel in Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for this inexpressible gift. So as we look at this passage, I think that... that Paul has a few categories of things he wants us to understand, some, some upsides that maybe we aren't wanting to see as readily as the risks and the downsides. And the first thing that I think we see here is the abounding results. He says, hey, there's some results that are going to come into your life if you trust God in this area, if you give as he's calling you to give. And these aren't just subtle kind of uh, present but unnoticeable things. They're abounding, they're bold, they're, they're extravagant, they're significant. And I think that there's three that we see here and I want us to, to take a look at those today. And the first is that if we walk in obedience to God's plan for us in this area, we're going to see the arrival of contentment. In verse eight, did you hear what he said? He said, um, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times... It's a lot of alls, isn't it? He's saying, hey, God is going to give you everything you need all of the time. That's pretty cool, isn't it? And maybe there's the tension in the room because we hear that and in our minds, we don't feel that. We look at our life and it doesn't feel like God has given us everything we need all of the time. And this is a place we're gonna camp out for a second because this mindset of how we evaluate the things that we have in life is significant. Because Paul wants to have this foundation that God has, in fact, given us everything we need at all times. But yet we've programmed our brain to look at all the things we don't have. We've programmed our brain to look at all the things we want and we have this incredible awareness of how we have not gotten all the things that we want, at least from our perspective, and it's caused us to miss this, this incredible opportunity of contentment by realizing all the things we do have. See, if we want to grow in contentment, it, it requires us coming back to this idea of realizing what God has given us and how he has given us so much instead of focusing on what we don't have. And I learned this in a pretty powerful way a couple years ago. We had just started uh, these Baja home build trips where we go down to Baja, California, and we build homes for these families in need. And just the trip in general is this incredible experience of, of, of gratitude and contentment by realizing how blessed we are here in the United States. 
But we partner with this organization called Baja Bound, and they handle the vetting of the families to make sure that there's worthy, like great people that are receiving these free homes. They, they work with the logistics and ordering all the materials so that we can just uh, fundraise, pay for the house, and show up and build. It's incredible. And they also provide a, a project leader. This person's the liaison that works with us and kind of makes sure that, that the trip's going well, and if we need something, they're our point person. And, and for this, the last several trips, we've had this, this one individual, and she's been doing ministry in Baja for about 20 years, and she, that is her calling and her passion. And on this trip, she had a, a group of us at the, the guest house, and we were talking, and she said, hey, can I do something real quick? She said, can each of you go around in a circle, and can you share the one thing you dislike most about the house you live in? And I knew that this was like a spiritual bear trap that we were all ready to jump into, but I was, I was there for it. And I won't share what some of the other people said. Maybe you can, in your mind, imagine what your answer would be. But I, as the, the answers went around the circle, I began to dread a little bit because I immediately knew my answer and I was kind of ashamed of it. And it came to me and I had to confess that the thing I disliked most about my house was the color of the carpet. <laughs> now, it wasn't that the carpet is like gross and stained and ratty. It was actually in great condition, but it, it was red. And not just red, it was like dark red, like murder scene red <laughs> everywhere. Like you, you could not come in without noticing. It was like, oh, it's red. Uh, and, and for about two and a half years at that point, we had lived in this house. And I realized in that moment how I had skipped over the blessing that this house had been because of my focus on the thing I didn't like. Because this house had been an incredible blessing, I was so thankful for the opportunity to rent it and the amount that, that it was rented to us for. We, we had been so thankful for just the, the layout of the house and the space that it was and how it worked for our family and allowed us to be in the rotation of hosting our life group. We had been thankful for the backyard that was fenced in and that our kids loved to play in. We were thankful for our neighbors and how they were gracious and kind to our kids. And yet for two and a half years when someone asked about my house, my brain immediately went to complaint because of carpet. <laughs> Talk about first world problems, right? In that moment, I realized how powerful it can be when we choose to focus on what we don't have instead of the blessings that we do have. And I find it fitting that on this week leading into our national holiday of Thanksgiving, we are challenged to pause and realize that God has, in fact, given us all things that we need at all times. And if this is a struggle for you, if you want to experience this, this, this arrival of contentment, let me challenge you with a little point of homework. Let me challenge you to, to write down some things that you're thankful for that God has blessed you with and that you want to live in gratitude for. And so in your life notes, there's actually three blanks that you can fill in. And I wanna challenge you to not just like write down the first three that come to mind. Like, oh, I'm thankful for my house that doesn't have red carpet. Uh, I'm thankful for my family, my health. Like pause and really think about this. And maybe there's even some things that you've complained about that you need to write down because you see the blessing that that's brought, how God has worked to redeem something tragic or difficult in your life, and that's actually a thing you can now be grateful for. But financially, if, if we want to experience contentment, it requires us focusing on what we do have instead of what we don't. Because if we want to experience contentment in this category as well, generosity plays into that. Because the very act of being financially generous is a statement that you have enough. The, the, the act of giving is a statement that you have enough for your needs to be met so much so that you want to meet other people's needs. In fact, I think it's so amazing that the very act of tithing is this, this physical statement that's being made that says, I believe that God will provide my needs so much that I'm willing to give away 10% of my income because I know that he will supply my need if I have it. Because apart from the faith in Jesus and the trust that God is the giver of all good and perfect things in our life, tithing makes no sense. But if you do believe, in fact, that God is perfect and he is a perfect heavenly father who wants to provide for our needs, then it's this incredible statement of faith. It says, God, I trust you to provide for my needs and I'm going to demonstrate it through my actions. 
And as we do this, we move from a scarcity mindset where we feel we have to clutch and hold on to every last penny, and we get to move into this abundance mindset because we worship the owner of all things. We worship and follow a God who owns everything in the universe and wants to freely give to his children. So if we walk with generosity and we trust him in this area, we get to experience the abounding result of contentment. We also get to experience the growth of God's character in us. Verse 8 finishes with this statement. It says, um, so that you may abound in every good work, it says. He goes through how we have all of these things. We have all sufficiency in all things at all times so that we may abound in every good work. How many of you want to abound in every good work? Doesn't that sound awesome? You get to be like, be excellent in all the good things. And that's the promise that God has for us. That this is a result we will experience is that we will get to abound in every good work, every good deed, every good thing that we want to live out to the world around us. And the reason for that is because it, our character is being shaped to be more like the character of our Heavenly Father in that process. If we want to abound in every good work, then we, we have to emulate the one who is perfectly good, and that is God himself. And if we want to grow to be more like God, the truth is we have to grow to be more generous because God has a generous heart towards us as his people. If we were to, to pause and, and, and really reflect on this, it's not that we have this long list of things to be grateful for. It's actually that we have this long, incredible list of ways that God has been generous towards us and blessed us. The book of James says that every good and perfect gift comes from God above. Every good and perfect gift. Every good thing that you've experienced in life is because there's a heavenly father who is generous towards you and has given those things to you. And so generally, we are all the the incredible recipients of his generosity, but specifically, we also are recipients of the generosity of his forgiveness. He sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for our sins so that we could be forgiven, so we could be made whole, so we could have a restored relationship to our heavenly father so that we could exchange our sin for Christ's righteousness. None of this is what we deserve. We deserve wrath and condemnation. But God is generous towards us as his people. And if we want to abound in every good work, we need to grow to have the character of God in our life, and that requires us living generously because God is generous towards us. And this takes us back to the statement that we make so often here at Calvary, that God doesn't need your money he owns everything. He, like, all of this is his. He doesn't actually need it. He was the one that gave it to you to start with. And the church doesn't need your money. The church is the bride of Christ. God will provide for the needs that the church has. And yet, the third truth is that we, as his people, need to give. And part of this need to give is to grow in the experience and, and, uh, and, and skill of generosity, As we give, we are growing to have more of God's character and heart of generosity towards the people around us. Now, I admit, this isn't just about finances. We need to be generous in other areas of our life, too. We need to be generous with our time, with our abilities, with our knowledge, our skills. We need to be generous with forgiveness as God is with us. We need to be generous in our service to others. But here's the thing that I've noticed just watching people throughout the years. Those that were financially generous seem to abound in good works of other generosity with their life. So I think that if we are not willing to trust God at the point of financial generosity, it's going to be much harder for us to be generous in those other categories of life as well. So God wants us to abound in every good work by growing his character in us. If we trust him with our finances, we get to experience that And finally, if we walk in obedience here, we see the arrival of God's provision. Verse 10 says this. It says, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Now, there's a lot of agricultural references there, and uh, I I grew up here, but I call this more the city than like the country. Uh, And I admit that the only thing I'm good at growing is mold on leftovers that I forget to eat and kind of find their way to the back of my fridge. Um, 
But it's not hard to see what he's, what he's communicating there. He's communicating that God is the one who's provided these good blessings to your life. And he says that he's not only going to continue doing that, but that he wants to increase and he wants to multiply it. Like, think about that. The, the God of the universe is the giver here. The God who's the origin of all good and perfect things, the God who is the origin of all blessings and all incredible things that we get to experience wants to not only continue doing that, but increase it and multiply it in our life. And the way that we do that is by us learning to give more in, in receipt of that. As God blesses us, we bless others, and as the more we do that, the more he will bless us. And we got to illustrate this a few weeks ago with that picture where God's pouring blessings into our life and if we want more to come, we need to let some blessings out to the world around us. But we have to understand that we don't get to pick the type of blessing or the timing of blessing, that's up to God, but we get to determine if he's going to pour more in, if he's going to continue to increase and multiply, if we continue to increase and multiply our generosity to the world around us. Now, here's the thing. Some of you maybe have really gotten caught up because we want to think, well, God's blessings have to be financial if we're challenged to give financially. But here's the thing. We're not told that it's a, a reciprocal thing. It's not an exchange rate. Like, you, you put so much in the tithe and so much hits your bank account on Monday. Like, it's not this exchange rate like when you travel to other countries. But beyond that, maybe God is wanting to bless you with other things. Maybe he's wanting you to be blessed with the fruit of the Spirit in your life, with more love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control as a result of you walking in financial obedience. Maybe he's wanting you to experience the blessing of a wonderful family, a great marriage, an incredible job, a, a fruitful life group. Maybe these are the places of blessing that he has for you. And maybe if you're sitting here and not hearing the blessings that God's given you, but all the lists of things you feel like he hasn't given you out of what I just listed, maybe you need to loop back to that contentment homework and pause and go, okay, God, what have you blessed me with? And how can I focus on that more than what you haven't? But God has blessed us and wants us to bless more. But here's the thing. We see from this passage and so many others in Scripture that this isn't just for us. And so this passage also points us to the abounding impact that we're able to have on the world around us. Because he says, hey, this isn't just for you personally. There's a bigger picture here. There's, a, there's an impact that you're able to have on the world around you if you are obedient in this area. And the first thing is that we are blessed so that we can be generous. Verse 11 says this, it says, uh, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. See, the, the blessings of God were never intended to just make our life better. Now, they will do that, but that wasn't the sole purpose that they have in our life. And we see this all throughout Scripture. You go back to the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis, the book that, that, that describes the origin of everything. In chapter 12, we meet this guy named Abraham. And Abraham was going to be the, the origin of God's people. He was the, the one from whom, like, the promised descendants would come. The, the nation of Israel was established through him. And as God is speaking all these incredible promises to him, all these huge blessings that seem just too enormous to actually be real, he also tells them that, that he would be blessed so that all nations might be blessed through him. The blessings of God were never meant to just come into our life and stay. They, they were intended to come into our, our life so that it could enrich us and so that we could be generous and bless others in Jesus' name. And going back to that analogy, we were never meant to be reservoirs of blessing where they just come and they stay. We were meant to be rivers where they extend to other people and make a difference to the world around us. And so let me ask you today, are, are those blessings coming into your life and are they staying? Are they going out to other people? Are you being generous and allowing the fruit of God's blessing to touch other people, to touch your community, to touch the, the people that you interact with, the people you're in relationship with? Do they see God through your generosity? 
Because the other thing that we see in this passage is that living generously can lead people to Jesus. We see that a little bit at the end of verse 11 there, that, that it would produce thanksgiving to God. But in verse 13, it says, by their approval of the service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from this, this, the confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them. Paul's saying, hey, this, this offering that is being collected for the church in Jerusalem there in Corinth, he says, they're going to praise God because of your generosity. Now notice, he didn't say they'll praise the people in Corinth and wow, what a great church that must be and how awesome they are. He says, no, they're gonna praise God when they see you living this out. This is another illustration of what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 16. Jesus said, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. If we are willing to trust God and live lives of generosity with our finances, with our time, with our ability, with our lifestyle, people are going to see a life that looks different than the world around them. They're gonna see people who look different than the culture that says you have to pay attention for your needs more than anyone else. You gotta put down other people so that you can succeed. You gotta prioritize your needs. They're gonna see someone that looks different. And they're gonna see someone who looks different and points them towards Jesus in that. Because at the end of the day, if we are willing to live generously, it shows that that it'll point them to a God who is generous. A God who is generous with forgiveness and grace towards them. A God who is generous to pour purpose and blessing into their life if they submit to him as their savior. So today, is this true of your life? Are you living a generous life that's pointing people to Jesus? Are you, is your character, your obedience to Jesus, your generosity in your daily life pointing people to a God that is generous and gracious? Or is the lack of these things causing people to question the authenticity of the message of Christ? And I pray that you would live a life of generosity with your finances, with your time, with your ambitions, with your priorities, so that the world around would see the generosity of Jesus in you and through you. But here's the thing, at the end of the day, each one of us has to make this decision for our own. We have to decide in our heart if we're wanting to live this out, not under compulsion or pressure, but we have to decide if we're willing to do this. And today I pray that you would cheerfully obey God's plan for your life and that it would have both abounding results and an abounding impact on the world around you. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that you are generous with us as people who don't deserve it, who have in fact given you countless reasons to not be gracious and generous. And we admit that For whatever reason, finances are the thing that is an incredible tension for us. It causes so much fear, so much anxiety, so much tension in our life. Even the idea of of thinking on this for the last few minutes likely has caused tension in the minds of many here. And I pray today that we would learn to trust you more than the dollar in our bank account or our wallet. I pray that we would learn to trust you and your provision more than our ability to go work and provide for ourselves because you have actually been the one providing all along. We've just put our name on it instead of yours. And God, we look at these results that, that we all would love to see in our life and realize that it's, it's you that can bring them. And so we pray today that you would be at work blessing us, guiding us, helping us cheerfully obey the plan that you have for us so that we could experience your blessings in our life and be conduits of those blessings to the world around us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Experiencing contentment, developing a godly character, and the awareness of God's provision are some of the results of practicing generosity. Our pastors and ministry leaders publish three to five minute devotional videos every weekday to our Facebook and YouTube channels. If you'd like to be notified when they are posted, we invite you to sign up by visiting calvaryaz.com forward slash D-E-V-O. 
I hope they can encourage you as you start each day in God's Word. Well, that's all for today. Please come back again next week. Bye-bye. Are you looking for a way to dive deeper into scripture and make it a part of your daily routine? Check out Calvary's Word for the Day daily devotional videos. Visit calvaryaz.com forward slash D-E-V-O and sign up to receive these three to five minute devotionals right to your inbox each day. Our team of pastors and leaders share meaningful insights from the Bible to equip and encourage you in your faith journey. Don't miss out on this opportunity to grow in your relationship with God and connect with the community of believers. Sign up today and start receiving your daily dose of scripture.